Good afternoon. My name is Irma Nicholson. I am a caregiver and an advocate for my husband living with Alzheimer's. I'm a member of the Dementia Friendly America Initiative and an advocate. I have joined two support groups, the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden and Picket Fences of Largo. Today, I, I'm having a conversation with my friend Vanessa Hooker, who is a caregiver and an advocate for her mom. Vanessa and I have been friends for over six years. We met during a support group meeting at the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, and we later joined Picket Fences of Largo. We know that through these times that Vanessa and I have been friends for many years, and we have seen each other through so many situations. During this discussion that we're gonna to have today, we know that dementia, has many symptoms. And today we're going to be discussing one of the uh, most serious one, which is wandering. Before we go into the discussion about wandering, I want to give you a definition of wandering. Wandering is one, again, one of the most serious form uh, and symptoms of dementia and other related Alzheimer's. We know that wandering is when someone leave their home and they forget where they're going and they also forget how to get back they become lost confused and disoriented we know as caregivers that this is one of the most distressing things that we can take care of is worrying about our loved ones not being able to turn or return back home safely I have read that the Alzheimer's Association have said that over 60% of people with Alzheimer's would wander at some point. So with this being said, Vanessa, have you noticed anyone in your family wandering? Yes, um, Irma, indeed I have. Um, and um, I just like to say, in my experience, um, wandering shows up differently in every family. Um, and I think it depends on whether or not, whether or not the person is driving um, at the time of the onset of the dementia. Um, in my case, um, it was my mother's car, and it was the keys that were always triggers for her. Um, my mother just always wanted to go somewhere. And um, because she was so independent, um, she really didn't want me to take over driving her everywhere. Her doctor had advised her that um, it would be best for me to try and persuade her to stop driving. Um, and that uh, we were more focused on driving safety. The doctor did tell me that it was going to be a challenge because it was a part of her independence and that uh, we would be, I would be working against her not wanting to give up her independence. And the issue with the driving safety had to do with mom's cognitive skills, the ability to make split second decisions and or to read street signs. So I just became very protective and I was just so worried about her being in an accident or causing an accident. So um, this was a very frustrating time and it took a while before I was able to remove the car and then eventually uh, sell it back to the dealer. So this was a very challenging time in, in our journey. So Vanessa, with uh, you having that situation, was there any wondering signs in terms of your mother uh, with the car situation? And if there were, uh, what would you say would uh, cause her to wonder? Yes, um, absolutely. There were definitely warning signs. Um, one of the main ones is um, a person will forget how to get to uh, familiar places. And um, one particular night, 
uh, mom called me and she was absolutely frantic. I believe she was even crying a little bit. She was disoriented. She was lost. She said she didn't tell me she was at the gas station and she couldn't find her way back. So, you know, of course, I became alarmed at hearing this. It was dark outside. It was rainy. Um, so I tried to compose myself and I asked her, I said, well, mom, can you see the name of a street? Can you tell me the name of a street if you can see one? And so uh, she told me the street name and then um, I asked her, well, what is the name of the gas station? Can you tell me that? And so she told me that. And so based on that information, I was able to I had an idea of where she was. So I told her to wait right there that I was on my way. And so I quickly got to where she was. And, you know, by the grace of God, she was there, just standing there at the gas station outside of her car, just looking very lost, um, just looking very um, afraid and frightened. And I was just so thankful that I was able to get to her in that instance and get her um, safely back home. And I think she was a little bit, um, she, was, she was relieved to see me. Um, and I think on another occasion, uh, mom went for a visit to visit her sister. And um, after the visit, she left, she departed to leave. And she, my aunt lived in a circle around a circle and so this particular day she forgot to bear off to the right to exit the circle to come home a very familiar place and we've been there many times mom knew how to get there almost with her eyes closed in the past so um she went completely around the circle and ended up right in back in front of my aunt's house and so she what she did was she called my aunt and she said i'm lost and i need directions to get home and so my aunt was a little bewildered and she said, um, well, where are you? And so uh, my mother said, well, I think I'm in front of your house. And so my aunt had my mom to park the car and come in and just kind of calm herself a little bit and just kind of talked her through it. And she was able to kind of, you know, walk mom through, you know, how to get home and so my mom left and she felt a little better and she was able to make it back home but that was the second incident and mom was you know able to safely get back home but two very very uh, frightening um, incidents that could have you know turned out very very um, dangerous for mom um, and I think uh, some of the causes were that mom could have possibly been bored you know she lived alone and so she had a lot of energy so and that's another cause is excessive energy so um, and she loved participating in activities and doing things but she was faced now with the challenge of just her brain changing and not being able to function in the manner that she was used to so vanessa it sounds like it was a very uh frightening experience for you and uh, uh how did you address those behaviors with your mother so um, one of the things to address her um, excessive energy was I enrolled her in the uh, Maryland Adult Daycare. Um, this was a very active um, daycare and I loved it because I could drop mom off in the morning and like between 8.30 and 9 o'clock and then I could pick her up around 4 o'clock. And so this place was absolutely fabulous it's um they had activities they got um breakfast lunch and a snack um so they enjoyed meals together uh, and they found out that mom enjoyed uh, music so they played music lots of music games activities just kept her really busy which helped her to you know um express some of that excessive energy that she had and it was a great thing for me to because it gave me an opportunity to have some me time alone from mom where i could kind of regroup 
and get myself together and then be, you know, refreshed and prepared for mom when I picked her up in the evening. Another way that um, I addressed the behavior was to, at every opportunity, I would try to, you know, just gently remind her, mom, okay, we need to, um, we need to, you know, you need to let me start doing all the driving. And I made myself available for her to, you know, take her anywhere she wanted to go. Um, and every opportunity, just try to gently persuade her, we need, you know, let's, you know, let me have the keys and let me do the driving. But this was always a difficult conversation. Mom still just didn't want to have any part of that conversation. She wanted her car and she wanted her, her uh, keys at all times. Um, so I did register mom for the Alzheimer's Safe Return Program. And this is a program that facilitates, they work in, um, in coordination with the Medical Alert Foundation. And they provide wandering support for individuals that are separated from their families. They have a 24 hour, seven day a week service. Um, they have uh, a 1-800 number, that's 1-800-432-5378, as well as there's information about uh, this program on the um, website at www.lz.org. And actually, I had to use this um, program one time in one of the instances when mom um, got lost or she had gone somewhere and she I had been gone for a long time and I didn't know where she was. So. Well, Vanessa, it sounded as if uh, you have done some things that was really uh, proactive in terms of uh, putting your mother in that adult daycare and which I hear is a fabulous program and um, signing her up for the re, uh, safe return program so uh vanessa with that being said how did what kind of lesson did you learn from the experience that you have had with your mother thus far you know irma you know the the main thing that i think i learned was um removing the car from in front of the house where she could see it every day was um, was key. Once I eventually got that car away from her where she could see it, and I just simply moved the car from in front of her house to my house. And so she couldn't see it every day. And once once I did that, that was the key thing. So you know, anyone that's involved or has a loved one that um, may be going through this, m removing that vehicle from where they can see it, it's a reminder, it's a trigger that, you know, that's their, that's their possession and they know that they, you know, this is their vehicle. And so once we, you know, was able to get it from in front of the house, we were halfway there. So that, that really helped sound as if you did the right thing in terms of moving the trigger items which was the car keys and the key from in front of the house so what would you say some of the uh other uh things that would trigger a person um to wander from the alzheimer's association i know there's a lot of information out there on the alzheimer's website uh, dealing with wandering so what would you say would be some of those causes Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, the Alzheimer's um, Association has a great website. Um, and actually, one, some of the things that they say um, that a wanderer will do is they, they, they try to go, they always want to go home in spite of the fact that they might be in their home. Um, that's one of the things they may do. They become restless. Um, they may pace, uh, make repetitive movements. Um, they may forget to get to a certain place 
or where they have come from or getting lost, which is some of the things that we talked about. They could become confused or frightened. And, you know, they have a full uh, list of, of things like this that you should look for signs of wandering. So, and they have that listed on their website at www.alz.org or as well as a 24-hour helpline at 1-800-272-3900. You know, Vanessa, I have heard that the experts say that uh, wandering uh, gets worse as the disease uh, progresses. So what uh, tools would you recommend for someone uh, that the Alzheimer's uh, have put out there that they can use? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, some of the tools that the Alzheimer's Association recommend are the GPS tracking devices. These are items that can be placed in a wanderer's shoes that can track them wherever they are at all times, as well as they have devices that can go on a vehicle. So the GPS tracking devices, there are alarm devices that can go on doors, um, windows, uh, cabinet doors, as so that if someone is exiting, you know, the a door, then you'll have an alarm that will let others in a, in a home know that your loved one may be trying to exit. Um, there are also bed alarms that will beep and let a caregiver know that a loved one is um, getting out of bed. Um, there, the medical alert system, the, like the personal emergency response systems that are commonly used for a loved one who may fall, um, these are also tracking. They also track movements as well as the GPS tracking for wandering. And one of the other things that the Alzheimer's Association recommends is covering handles and maybe placing um, a black rug in front of a door and then that way it um, the the black hole it, the black covering looks the black mat looks like a hole and so it will kind of give the loved one your loved one the illusion that there's a hole there and keep them away from that area so Vanessa with uh, again that being said said we look at we are trying to protect our loved ones and we want to make sure that they are safe uh, we want to know what uh, advice would you give someone that is just going through this say for the first time what would what advice would you give to that person um i would recommend um that you make a plan you know, if you have a loved one that um, may be recently diagnosed, like I said, we received our diagnosis um, early in the early in the stages of the uh, dementia. And one of the first things that the that the doctor told me alarmed alerted me to was about the driving safety. So I would, uh, you know, make a plan. The Alzheimer's Association is a great resource. And they actually say that 94% of the people who wander are within one and a half miles of where they were last seen. Um, and the stress that you experience when for just one moment, you don't know where your loved one is, is just absolutely horrifying. I would just not want to see anyone experience that if possibly avoidable. Um, I would say keep a list of contacts to call for help and have these numbers ready and accessible. Um, post them on the refrigerator, just keep them very close by and handy. I would say also to um, ask neighbors, family, friends, that if they see your loved one alone, and not with someone, not with you in particular, or other family members, that that would be a red flag so that someone makes sure they have your number and how to contact you immediately if they see this. 
keeping a good recent photo of your loved one is a good idea, as well as updated information about any medical condition that they may have. Uh, know the neighborhood, the environment, um, know if there are uh, bodies of water or uh, tunnels, bus stops, heavy traffic, roads in the neighborhood that your loved one may be able to wander off to. Uh, keep a list of where um, places where your loved one may wander. And this could be, you know, a past place of employment, um, a former place that they lived, a place of worship or favorite restaurant. And last but not least, I would say um, enrolling them in the Alzheimer's Safe Return Program. That's a great program. Um, I had my mom enrolled in that and um, they actually provide a safety bracelet that um, your loved one cannot remove and on the back of the bracelet, it will have um, information about your loved one, their name, um, and any, um, any medications that they are allergic to, and a telephone number for them to contact if that loved one gets away from you. So they were a very, very good resource. But Vanessa, I think those are very good uh, tips that you have given someone. And, you know, we want, again, to make sure that our loved ones are protected because we have heard of the incidents uh, that have happened with loved ones that have gone wandering. Uh, the matter in which the person in Watkins Park that went missing and the results wasn't good. So uh, the SAFE uh, return program is an excellent uh, tool that you can tell someone. And we want to just make sure that everyone just uh, be aware of all the tips that are out there so that you can keep your loved ones safe. And we realize that, um, that a person that's going through this for the first time, uh, that it is important that they recognize the warning signs. Uh, with that being said, we have uh, previously been talking about um, various stages of the gems that uh, our loved one goes through. And I want you to explain what a gem is and what stage did your mother, was she in when she first started to wander? And we know that no two people are the same when they're going through uh, the dementia or Alzheimer's. Yes, absolutely. Um... So when you, when you think about a gem, you think about a precious stone that, you know, over time has molded and developed. And so this concept has been uh, developed by uh, Tipa Snow, um, and it's a positive approach to care. Um, it is a cognitive model that looks at the various changes in the brain that occurs over time with someone with dementia. Um, and there are six stages that are associated with the changes and they are uh, coined after or named after a precious gem. For example, the sapphire, which is uh, the first stage um, or the, the kind of the pre-stage where you have optimal cognition, um, you have a healthy brain, and there's no signs of dementia at all. So that would be the perfect uh, category. Um, the next um, category would be a diamond. Um, they're clear and sharp. Um, routines and are those prevailing um, identifiers of a diamond. Uh, the emerald is green, and it's a person on the go with purpose. They have some flaws, but they don't really particularly recognize those flaws, and they're very much on the go. Uh, the amber is a person that's caught in time, and caution is required for this stage. The ruby is when the 
the disease has kind of advanced quite a bit and it's difficult to see what is possible. They might become, you know, more quiet, more resolute in themselves and uh, less communication is involved. And then finally is the pearl where that person has kind of completely withdrawn and um, they're hidden in a shell. But there are beautiful moments and beautiful um, things that occur during each stage. And so Tipa Snow says that each person can flourish and, and maintain in each um, stage of the, the gems. And one of her famous quotes is, just like gems, which are precious stones, each person is precious, valuable, and unique. And that's kind of the model that we have been studying about and learning over the last few, uh, few weeks, which has been so valuable. It's been very, very helpful for me to understand these different stages because it really helps you to identify your loved one. And I would say that mom, when, um, when we um, received her diagnosis, she was a diamond because she was still very sharp, still very clear, and, um, but she had certain routines and rituals that she did. Um, when she was distressed, she could be cutting and rigid with me. And she often saw me as a threat a lot of times. Um, she became less aware of her boundaries. And uh, she was, was very possessive of her personal space and her belongings, especially her car keys. And, you know, sometimes it was hard to tell if mom was choosing her behavior truly or if she actually had limits in her ability. Um, she was still socially engaged um, and she had very good cover skills. So that was one of the challenges with her at, at the beginning stages. And then, you know, as, as the disease progressed, I think later um, she moved into an emerald um, where she was focused on what she wanted her immediate need in the moment. Um, she became less aware of her safety and um, changing abilities. Um, she was misplacing things and she was always accusing someone of taking someone, something from her. Um, and she did during that stage start to say that she wanted to go home in spite of the fact that she was already in her home. Vanessa, I really want to thank you for sharing your story. I tell you, it is so amazing just to hear some of the um, situations that you had to go through. And we're just hoping that um, everyone just take the time and just uh, listen to some of the tips, the uh, tools that you have given us. And it's just been really exciting just to talk to you and to share your story with others that it might help. At the end of this video, we want to show uh, the uh, black doormat and the door covering so that everyone will be aware of what to look for. So if your loved one decide to try to wander and go out the door, that this would be a prevention to stop them. And so if there's any question, feel free to ask and uh, Vanessa or I would try to answer. And if we cannot, then Vicki Kalinsky or uh, Shonda Bellamy would be able to answer. Thank you and have a great afternoon.